<laughs> Hello. Um, I know I wasn't going to do any um, of these calls on the weekend, but there was an opportunity and I might not be able to make um, circumstances came up next week and I might not be able to make um, this time happen next Tuesday. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to uh, create a video now. Um, what was, again, I always come fully with an open heart, not sure quite what's going to come through me. I was thinking um, today of touching on this topic of authenticity. This is something very uh, important value for me. As you can see, I'm tearing up again. It means it touches something very deeply within me. Uh, yes, <clears throat> this topic of authenticity. Uh, how do we live in alignment with what we know is true for us? Sometimes we can think of authenticity as this uh, sort of something that happens in the big moments, you know, or um, authentic expression can be tied up as we talked before of these concepts of being loving and kind, the self image of how we want to be seen. But how does authenticity line up with that? Maybe to be truly authentic in the moment is to admit, you know, I'm not happy right now, or I feel sad right now. To me, I think of authenticity less as how it's expressed and how it looks to others and more in alignment with what's true for ourselves in that moment. And to not define ourselves as a person based on whatever is expressing through us in that moment. So if there's sadness, it doesn't mean that I'm a sad person or I'm an unhappy person. But can I be in alignment with that movement that's happening within me? So authenticity doesn't have to look like any one thing. It's being open and willing and allowing whatever is true for us in that moment, you know, to really be in harmony with that. And for me, I shared um, yesterday about leaving this job that I had recently. And on the surface, mentally, when I went into it, intellectually, I couldn't justify a reason as to why I should leave this job. Yet in my heart, something just didn't feel in tune, didn't feel in alignment. And so being willing to trust in that, that sense within us, that movement that wants to happen. I was reflecting this morning too on a past relationship that I've had of um, how when we can really trust and be in sync with our own authentic movement, we're no longer grasping at that other person. Somehow there can be, when we've come to see that the beauty of residing within that movement as it wants to happen within us, there can be space for others, for us to give others permission for that movement to happen within them. And it doesn't mean we might not be disappointed or might, um, would rather, you know, maybe them have it, spending more time with us or whatever it might be. But there is a greater desire in us to give them space to be in their own authentic movement, even if that might take them away from, from us at times or maybe for good. It's a love that doesn't need that person to be anything in particular for us or to be with us to be to love them or to act in a certain way for us to love them. There's space, total space for the person to be as they are and to follow their own instincts. But that can be really difficult to do unless we've come within our own being 
and can see the, the qualities that manifest themselves within us when we do choose to be in alignment with that. The peace, the harmony, the sense of beauty in our own being. And I still get challenged at times. I've noticed this summer that I was taking positions and taking these, um, uh, I was doing relief work and taking these jobs on that weren't really what I wanted to be doing, but there was still this mental ling lingering thought or beliefs that were playing out in my experience and still play out in my experience. I'm still noticing them come this morning even, that I need to take those shifts in order to be okay later, you know? I don't, I don't know how else I'm going to pay the bill, so I need to do these. Even though in my heart, um, my heart wasn't always in it. I mean, it was okay and I could muster through. And some moments were good moments and then somehow I would use that to justify continuing to go on and how often we do that, you know. There's some good points of it, so then we discount everything else. So it, again, it's no black and white. It doesn't mean that because in certain times I didn't want to take these positions or I felt like I was in resistance to being there, but at other times I did. So often the mind can paint it in a black or white. You know, this means that then I shouldn't be doing this job or I shouldn't be taking any more shifts. But this... Uh, our true nature doesn't really manifest that way. It's more of a spontaneous knowing, a spontaneous following. So in some moments, we might be led to do that. In other moments, we might be led away from that. But we don't know the outcome. That's where we get attached to this outcome of, you know, projecting a future state. I might not have enough resources later, so I should do this now. And as I was saying, I've caught in it again now. I'm being offered some shifts through this um, previous position I had again. And I'm, I'm feeling like, yeah, I, I could do it. But something in my heart, and this is the beauty of talking things through too, sharing my own process with you, is that some, sometimes it can help to bring clarity within myself, you know, deepen the knowing. So that's not just a knowing here, but it's a knowing that's lived through here. Because the knowing up here doesn't translate into how we live our lives. It has to kind of permeate down to a cellular level where we can experience, you know, the truth of it in our own being. And so I can notice that I could do this shift, but do I really want to do this shift? No, I'm quite enjoying this kind of spacious time that's right, that's happening right now and lots of time to reflect and play in my garden, to do things like this, to create these videos, to connect with people in some way. You know, this connection is happening kind of in one, just in one direction right now, but this, um, even though it's, it's not just necessarily authenticity about connecting with the other, but how we connect with ourselves. It feels like something's in harmony with myself, myself when I do this. When I'm in my garden, yesterday when I was painting the shed. You know, even painting the shed, something that maybe at times I resist doing. You know, I don't really want to do that. It seems laborious and time consuming and I'm not that great at it. And I might wreck it and might not look good and I might waste my money and all the stories that I create around it. But yet there was this movement to go to the store and to get the paint and to, and I noticed I checked in with myself several times while I was painting. 
And I didn't feel that sense of contractedness where I felt in the past. Oftentimes I would do it, I would kind of psych myself into doing it. And there would be this mental, I would have to willpower myself to do it. And then I would do such a sloppy job because I just kind of wanted to get it done and on to the next thing. I was using it as a means to an end. Like I wanted it to be painted, but I didn't really want to do, I didn't want to invest anything in the painting. But yesterday as I checked in with myself, no, I actually did want to be there. I was having fun and enjoying, even though I made a few mistakes here and there. I wasn't trying to rush it. I wasn't, I could take the time and kind of fix things a little bit as I went. There was a couple moments at the beginning where I was trying to tape some things where I felt the frustration arise and I just noticed that. Even that, I don't really feel like I, there was so much resistance to it. I was just kind of seeing that it was happening within me. But that extra layer of shaming myself for it or that this shouldn't be here or this means now that I shouldn't paint, that part of it wasn't there. And so today I had just kind of laid out in my head that maybe I would finish the painting today but still holding the space of being open that maybe that's not what wants, where this body mind is being drawn to today. Maybe it will be something else. That I can kind of have a loose plan in my mind, but not to stick to it as if it's a fact. Because then I'm putting this, then it's no longer an authentic expression. You know, authenticity being in harmony with oneself and harmony with life. It's a me, this false sense of a me that is living by shoulds and shouldn'ts and things, things need to get done to achieve certain outcomes. Doubting. And one thing that comes up for me often is this doubting that that inspiration will come. Maybe it'll never come, so I just need to force myself to do it now. I noticed that even with this position that I've been offered to work next weekend, Is that my mind's creating these hard, fast uh, boxes around it. It's like, I need to take this shift so that they'll know that I'm interested to give me shifts in the future, this agenda, bringing an agenda to it. And that maybe more opportunities won't come up, or maybe I'm never going to feel inspired to do it, so I just got to muscle through and do it. But really seeing that I don't know. I don't know that that's true. And the burden, the heaviness within me of when I'm trying to force myself to do it when I don't want to do it. I've been kind of playing around with that the last couple months. It's just noticing. Sometimes I have this thing with food where there's food in the fridge. And I feel I really don't like wasting food. And so... I will force myself, well, this would be the pattern before, as I would force myself to eat something that I didn't really want to eat because I didn't want to waste the food. And lately I've been playing around with, well, if I don't really feel like drawn to eating that today, just leaving it in the fridge and making something else that I do feel drawn to eat. And noticing how actually it all works out in the end. <laughs> That maybe the next day then I feel ready to eat that again or whatever it is. And for me, you know, it seems like this silly, simple example, but it's illustrating this greater truth to me. You know, it doesn't always mean that it's going to guarantee a certain outcome and everything's going to be used and fall exactly into place if we if we act on our authentic expression. No. I mean, when I expressed myself authentically, when I had this last position that I just left, it actually ended up in me losing the position. And so it wasn't, it wasn't the desired outcome per se. 
for the outcome that I thought would be in my best interest. But that was the outcome that felt truest to me in that moment. And I guess there was a, oh, the tears come, yes. I'm so grateful to be able to have been able to see these and hopefully share and inspire others to be able to trust in themselves too. However that looks. And so when I came to the conclusion, you know, that the most authentic thing for me was actually to leave that position. To express myself authentically and then to realize that the most authentic movement from there would be to leave the position. It wasn't what I had wanted to happen or thought best to happen. But there was a sense of, I don't want to say, it's not a sense of pride because it wasn't me that was that was doing it. It was more me be following where I was being led. There was a joy, I guess is the better word, of being able to follow that impulse knowing that it's possible within me, that I'm not bound by the fear that kept me for so many years following things and doing things that I didn't really want to be doing. Doing things I didn't want to do to be validated, to show that I'm lovable, that I'm worthy, to prove myself capable. That I am enough. And that's the beauty. It's the last thing that we want to do is to feel that sense of insecurity, that not enoughness, that discomfort, that uh, of not knowing the outcome. But the more that we can go and visit those places, those beliefs are infiltrating so many of our actions and creating so much suffering in our lives that we don't really realize until we start to question. doing things that we don't want to be doing in hopes of getting something eventually that will make it all worth it in the end. There's tremendous suffering contained within that. And as we start to see and awaken to how much we live by these shoulds and shouldn'ts, we're trying to get desired outcomes in a future moment. And to see how that's all coming from these place of these trying to avoid this inherent discomfort. The more we can visit that, the more we're not living from that sense of not enoughness, of insecurity, of feeling unlovable. Because we're in alignment with ourselves. We're in harmony with our own being. And in that, there's nothing to prove. There's nothing to defend. There's nothing we know in our core that there's nothing more we could do or achieve that will make us any more than we already are. But again, it's not something, a mental concept that we can choose to believe. It's something that we have to live out in our own experience. And it requires us being willing to go into those uncomfortable places. to see where that doubt is coming from. Where is that doubt coming from? What are the beliefs that are shaping all of my shoulds and shouldn'ts? Not just the superficial beliefs, but the beliefs at the core. You know, I should do this for this person. And maybe at the core, as we go down, 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 we see that we believe maybe that we're not inherently a lovable person. We're not inherently worthy of love as we are. Or maybe a fear of abandonment, being alone. And those are the beliefs that we want to invite in to really feel, feel in our whole body what it feels like when we're believing those things. And we can start to see it in those moments, those little moments maybe of 
how we compromise ourselves in certain ways. And then as we sit with that, we can start to feel in our body the pain of that. And we could start to notice the thoughts that we have attached to that. To that action or to that particular outcome. For me, it was a huge unveiling, even just asking myself the question, what would it be like to not have an agenda? I know I've mentioned this before, but this is a question that I feel is worthy of mentioning again. What is it like to live without an agenda? We can start to see all of the agendas that we bring into almost all of our encounters. and how fake and superficial it leaves our encounters with others. You know, when we have an agenda, we're not really there, available, present to the spontaneous expression as it wants to express. And so we can never be fully fulfilled through that encounter, or through that endeavor. Because we're always looking for it to provide something for us rather than just being in that experience. It's more of a resting back into our own being. A resting. We can come to life relaxed, you know. There's still this, um, an effort that will happen through us. Like, this is an effortless for me to have created this street. Like, there was effort that had to go involved in it, be involved in creating this. But it didn't come from an effortful place within me, this sense of angst. that trying energy, trying to do life. And yoga was actually pretty insightful for me to help me see this. Sometimes we were invited into postures where it seemed like there was so much effort and yet we were invited, can we relax into it? And at the time I, I didn't think it was even possible. I didn't understand what they meant and I really had to sit with that. What does that mean? How was it possible to do a posture of such intensity and not put any effort into it but the more we practice the more we come to see that it's possible that we can be doing this really strenuous activity and not be in resistance to it because the resistance is really the effort that uh, trying And it can be difficult for our minds to see that the trying is resistance because it feels like the trying is assisting us in doing what we need to do. But I encourage you to pause there and really reflect in your own experience. Just observe that when we are trying in a certain circumstance, that there's a sense of um, notice what's happening in your body in those moments when you're trying to do something. And that's how we can see the resistance in it. It's that felt sense of contraction. And notice in that moment what it would be like to just let go of that trying, even just a little bit. You know, it might still be there, but to see if even just like a little tiny bit, we can let go of that trying, uh, that tryingness that we're bringing to uh whatever we're doing in the moment. And then re-engaging in the activity from there. So it's almost like taking this pause in the doing 
to check in with ourselves, check in with what our thoughts are. Oftentimes when we're trying, we're lost in our head. We're not in touch with our body. Our mind might be racing. There might be a lot of frustration. We might see a tensing in our jaw or red our eyes. There might be more aggressiveness in our movements. It might be subtle, but we can start to, to pick up on it. And to just notice. That's all we're doing is just noticing. Because then if we notice the trying, and then we're trying to stop trying, we're adding another layer of resistance onto it. It's this, this mind-blowing, mind-boggling thing. But once we see it, it becomes so much more clear and easy to, to see how that just creates another layer of suffering. So it's tricky, but we just want to notice it and notice if we can just relax into it just a little bit more. And if we can't, can we, is it possible to just be with that too? That I'm trying right now and there's a lot of resistance in what I'm doing and I can't seem to muster up any anything in me that wants to let go even just a little bit. I know I've had those moments in my life where I felt the energy was so intense where I, I couldn't even sit to meditate. I like... My body was just like vibrating with intensity and there was like nothing in me that could get me to sit. And sitting is usually something that I do every day, a sitting practice. And so being willing to be with that too, that's how it's expressing right now or in that moment that there's a whole lot of energy in this being and there's nothing that I can do to, to let go at all. And can that be okay? Can that be okay? Because again, this is a welcoming of the wholeness of our being. And the wholeness even includes the resistance, that at times there might be resistance. Because if we're disconnecting from the resistance and trying to make the resistance go away, then we're disconnecting from a part of ourselves. The authentic expression as it's taking expression through us, as it's expressing through us. So authenticity is even welcoming in the resistance to maybe being our authentic self or following that guidance maybe we know in our being you know don't take that shift but then we end up following it anyway we notice that there's just this old impulse to follow along and there we are doing it again can that be okay can we be in harmony even with that or maybe there we are, caught again, following some old addictive behavior. Can I be okay with that too? And a tricky point here that I want to emphasize, because I got stuck here for quite a while, is that when I would say, can I be okay with that too, I'd follow maybe a compulsive behavior. And then just discount it. Oh, well, you know, this is just the authentic expression as it's moving me in this moment. So just follow along with it. But it's not quite that either. It's, it's a noticing without in, indulging in it. Or becoming complacent in our actions. It's really subtle uh, distinction that it's not in it to excuse behavior and just leave us to muddle along in all our dysfunctions. And to pretend to be okay with that. But to notice, this is, even to notice that this is actually playing out in a very dysfunctional way in my life. We're noticing the whole thing. We're noticing the compulsion. We're noticing how we go with it. We're noticing that we don't have the resist, and we don't have the ability to bring ourselves back or to disengage from that. And we're noticing how dysfunctional it is in our lives. And we're bringing that into our awareness too. 
you know, maybe we follow that addictive behavior and just noticing how it manifests in our body, the pain, the contraction, how we push people away, maybe how we hide or become secretive. We feel tight in our body. We don't feel fully present when we're with others. We're noticing all of that. And then when we notice all of that, it's no longer an excuse because we're taking in the whole picture. That, oh, you know, I just like to drink lots of coffee or have four glasses of wine after work, whatever our thing is. You know, that's just, that's just me. That's just my authentic expression. It's only a partial truth. <laughs> and that's really important to see too. Because we're still bound in suffering then. We're still bound up. And just kind of feigning okayness when in reality there's maybe a not okayness. That's why we, we feel so compulsive towards these things that we're doing. So to welcome in the not okayness. You know, so often I had experienced so much doubt. Doubt was probably one of my biggest things. So just I would doubt everything. And again, trying to secure a certain outcome using my intuition, trying to doubt myself, doubting my will, doubting if it was God's will, doubting, you know, should I have said that? Should I not have said that? Did that, not did that. And coming to see it's not really so much of what I chose to do. It was how I was in relationship to what I was doing. Was there some sense of not okayness that I was doing this from? And to notice that and to bring my attention back home and to notice that I actually don't feel okay within myself. There's some sense of not enoughness, insecurity, whatever that is fueling this action. And for me, I got so caught up in what the external was, you know, what I did was what mattered, not was not how I was in relationship to what I did. Again, as I said yesterday, we can get lost in comparisons because what someone else did, oh, they did that, so then it's okay. But maybe for us, we have a total different uh, expression that wants to come through, or maybe there's just some underlying discomfort as we do it. So the invitation in life isn't, the success of life isn't so much in what we do or don't do. It's the relationship, the quality of our own presence that we bring to every moment. The relationship that we bring to the moment. Am I fighting myself? Do I feel like I'm at odds with life? Deep down, to be honest about that. Like, am I doing this because I fear that life's not going to take care of me? That maybe I won't find the love that I want. So I'm going to settle and be in this relationship or again, whatever it might be. I just give these as an example. But we'll all have our own stumbling blocks. Is there some belief in separation from life? that there's me over here and life over here and I need to act in certain ways so that life will respond in certain ways. Because when we believe that we're separate from life, then we're always trying to manipulate and bring agendas to everything that we do. I mean, I encourage you to look for yourself. When I started to really ask that question deeply, I saw that Yes, and pretty much everything I did, there was some sort of an agenda. 
And then it doesn't mean even that, that we let go of all, like all our preferences. There might still be preferences like um, to do, to create, to share, to, you know, be financially secure. All of those things are still going to be there, but can we do it without the agenda, without that fear guiding our decisions and actions? Feeling like my okayness is dependent on what happens up there. So it's a way when we're in our authentic self, it's a way where we're grounded in ourself. <clears throat> where our sense of okayness, as I've said a few times before, that where our okayness doesn't fluctuate, go all over the map depending on the circumstances of life. That who we are at our core is okayness. And this can be powerful to see too, because so often we think that, you know, our agendas and ways we live are to get the love, to get the power, to get the approval, to get the whatever. To get peace, to get happiness. We come to see actually when we let go of all that, we really question and let go of all those beliefs. Not that we can just choose to let go of them, but as we start to see through them, they start their power over us starts weighing. We can come to see that our, our at our core we are love. We are joy. We are peace. It's not something that we get to add to us. That is the essence of who we are when we're in alignment with that core expression. It seems like, oh no, what's going to happen to me, you know, if I trust that authentic expression and it tells me to do something, you know, that seems totally counter to everything. I might lose a relationship, I might lose a job, I might, the list goes on and on. It takes tremendous courage to be able to, to listen, <laughs> to not only listen and hear that guidance, because I think all of us are quite aware most of the time of what that guidance, where that guidance is trying to take us. But then we layer it over with all these thought patterns that get in the way and muddle us, create confusion. The what ifs. The more we start acting and following in alignment, you know, and maybe it starts in really small ways, like I said, with how you choose to eat food in your fridge or whether or not you go for that run or that yoga class or not. Or even a big, uh, another one that came up for me last year was just this ability to lay in bed and not be able to sleep. Can I trust that that's the expression that wants to come forth without fighting it, without resisting it? So often before I would lay in bed and not be able to sleep and be fighting it the whole time, telling myself all these stories, you know, about I'm not going to be able to do what I'm, what's asked of me tomorrow. I'm going to be so tired. Out. And the more I, I could just see that and question, is that true? I don't know do I really know that I'm supposed to be asleep right now? What if I just use this time and really ground myself in the felt sense of my being, which can actually feel really blissful? Just to feel the sensations of the hands, the sensations of the feet, noticing the breath coming in and out. When we're not in resistance to it, not fighting and thinking more should be happening, it can be actually quite blissful. Just the simplicity of breathing and the sensations in the body. So to be able to question that, and 
I mean, I don't want to give you an answer that means that, again, there might be another expectation, you know, if I just be comfortable with it and use the times when I can't sleep to ground myself in my breath and my body that because Candace said that's how it was for her, that that's how it'll be for me, that I'll be okay. We don't know. Maybe we will be drugged the next day. All I can tell you is in my experience that I was surprised to find out that I actually functioned quite well. And oftentimes I was actually, I felt quite energized on those days. Quite energized and alive. I was quite surprised when I really looked at my experience that it wasn't at all what I thought it would be or should be given that I didn't sleep the night before, maybe one hour or something. And it's not trying to create any particular experiences, just that's how life was unfolding at that moment. I just couldn't sleep. Before I used to go into trying to fix it, okay, this means something's on my mind, something I need to look at or figure out. And that can be true, but instead of, that can also be a form of just resisting the moment as it is. It can be an added layer of doing when we can really just rest and relax back in our being and allow, you know, if there's anything that needs to be known, even saying a prayer this, or a mantra or however you want to describe it, just saying, you know, I'm open. If there's something that needs to be known that I need to know or do in this situation, to show me. And then be willing to let it go with that. You know, we don't need to continue then to figure it out and believe, oh, maybe I was shown or maybe I didn't, I didn't listen enough or I didn't look hard enough. This is a pattern in me. Oh. Believing, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't look hard enough because I still haven't figured this out. There must be something, some reason why I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. But I've come to see that it's no, it's not about trying to figure it out. Again, as I've said before, there might be a time and a place where we're feeling called and inspired to sit down and do a, like an intentional reflection. But to go around with that sense of always feeling like I didn't do quite enough or I should know the answer or the, the lingeringness of it all where it feels like there's this big problem weighing on you. That part doesn't need to be there. There might be something that we need to see and we might be trying to figure something out, but we don't need to make a problem out of it. Because problem has this kind of energy behind it that this should not be happening, that something is wrong. But maybe it's not that anything is wrong, it's just something is wanting to be seen, wanting to bubble up, wanting to transform or transmute. I mean, old condition, pattern, belief, or way of being was bubbling up to the surface. And I've even come to see that sometimes I don't even need to know what that belief was. Sometimes they just fall away and I don't even know what I was believing or what ch changed. It's just that something experientially feels different in how I'm showing up. So it could manifest in all number of ways and we can't have any expectation you know, of how it's going to look. <clears throat> but again, coming back to this sense of authenticity is trusting that moment, trusting that movement and how it wants to ebb and flow. You know, I started speaking for a little bit about a past relationship that I had and at the time, I wasn't quite sure if this was a good thing or not a good thing, but now reflecting on it again today, I could see that there was some really beautiful aspects of it. We really gave each other space to just follow. You know, he ended up going to Vancouver for a while on a road trip with his friend, and I was going to go off and do this yoga training. That never happened, but that there was the intention that Sometimes he would go out with his friends or have a dinner party and I would stay in the basement and watch TV or 
uh, I would have groups over at the house and he would, you know, be out working or there wasn't this, uh, I mean, at times these old beliefs would bubble up in me and the expectations would come forth, you know, oh, you need to be this certain person for me. Or I want to spend more time with you. You should be willing to spend more time with me. Or there was a, a trust, you know, that the space was given for him to be as he was and me to be as I was. Even if it didn't coincide, you know, maybe I wanted to spend more time with him and he wasn't there. But this space of being honored of being able to honor the flow within each other was. And at the time I still had a lot of doubts whether that was a good thing or not because we ended up doing a lot of things independently. We had different kind of, uh, he was very social and I was more at home and it's all these old doubts, you know, we should be more similar or he should spend more time with me or maybe I should be more social and hang out with him. But is that true? No. And how does that affect our relationships when we put these expectations, you know, of what we need onto them and demand them to fulfill us? Again, it's bringing these agendas like, how do we love without an agenda? To truly give space for that relationship to be as it is, for that person to be as they are, for us to be as we are. And are we willing to stay true to ourselves, even if it might be disappointing to the other in some way? Can we trust in our own true nature enough where we can let go of even that outcome? And I'm saying these things in a, a fairly simplistic way, not that they're not that they're easy at all. They challenge a lot of our deeply ground beliefs, you know. that how I am in this relationship and how this person shows up for me is a reflection on my lovability or my sense of safety or my ability to connect. It's really important to look at too because I noticed that in my, in my marriage when I was married, all the expectations that I imposed on my partner at that time this was in my 20s. Not that that's an excuse or means anything really, but I still, for me, I still had a lot of old beliefs playing out given what I'd seen growing up and how a relationship should be and what a man should be and what a woman should be. and Feeling caught in that, not wanting to be in those roles, but still feeling like that's how roles, still unconsciously playing out those roles and feeling this kind of angst within me. just really reflecting on how actually all of those expectations, those things that I thought would bring us closer together were actually bringing us further apart. I had layer upon layer upon layer of expectation placed on this person. Needing them to be certain things so that I was okay. To keep me okay, to prove that I was lovable to show the world that I was lovable. I was constantly needing this affirmation, you know, from the other person and constantly testing them with all the ways that maybe I wasn't lovable to see if they would still stay to prove to myself that there was this Maybe to prove to myself whether I was lovable or not, I guess. So, I mean, in some ways I felt free to just express all of those dysfunctional behaviors with him. So, I, in some ways, that was 
what was playing out at that moment and me following that was my own authentic expression. Yet at the same time, there was so much dysfunction in that and being willing to see that and come home. to living from a more grounded sense of self where those beliefs aren't layered on top of my own authentic expression. It's beliefs of unworthiness, unlovability, not enoughness, not okayness. Then surprisingly, it actually brings us closer together. It seems like when I'm more grounded in myself, that that will mean that I then no longer have other people around. I might, the mind might tell us that we'll be more alone, more isolated. And there might be times when we're more alone, but we don't feel that sense of loneliness in it. We still feel connected. We still feel connected to that life force that's flowing through us. We feel connected to other people, even though we might not agree with them. We might not necessarily want to be with them at a certain time or some moment but it doesn't have to mean anything more than that so when we have these deep ingrained beliefs below that are kind of filtering through or that all our actions are filtered through then all the graspiness and neediness and drama is brought into a relationship when it can really be quite simple saying that I'm not in a relationship right now, at least not an intimate relationship. But the awareness has grown within me. And I might still see things that come up for me. I'm always kind of willing to be in a stance of openness that I might see things and I'm, I'm okay with seeing them. Before I thought if I see these dysfunctions, it, it was just reinforcing the sense of shame and that okayness within myself. And now coming to see that, no, the more, um, not that I intentionally go looking for all the places that I'm not okay, but when I do see those places of dysfunction bubbling up, that I can be okay even in the seeing of them. Because I've come to realize that in the seeing of them is where I can be free of them. Free of being bound by living them out. free of living in that dysfunction and the pain and the contraction and the angst and the, all of that. So it requires going into those depths of our being and really questioning some of those deeply held beliefs. And it's not a much... I've seen so much with like cognitive behavioral therapy trying to switch it over. So I believe I'm unlovable. So let's switch it over to I am lovable. I mean, that has, uh, that does have an effect on our experience when we can switch over our beliefs and start believing other things about ourselves, but then we're still caught in this concept. So then when we're no longer grounded in our, deeper self, we're still engaged with ourselves as a mental image of ourselves. That caught in this duality, lovable, unlovable, kind, unkind, generous, selfish. Because there's going to be moments of our expression where we're going to be the opposite, potentially. And so then our sense of self will go down. Or we might see someone that's, you know, Maybe we think we're ugly, and so we start telling ourselves that we're beautiful, and then someone that's even more beautiful walks in the room, and then we're caught in our sense of self taking again. So our, when our sense of self is attached to a concept, that concept's always going to be fluctuating, and then our self-worth will continually be fluctuating. So to be able to free ourselves from the roller coaster of fluctuating and following all the shoulds and shouldn'ts of life and compromising continually and thinking that's how it, I will get my okayness, to tapping into the okayness that's already here. 
And instead of believing that I need to do this to then be okay, might it be possible that okayness is already here? And can I act from that place of okayness? That's where we're challenging our agendas. We're, we're no longer bring, then bringing an agenda to the interaction. We're acting from a deeper place within ourselves. Or we're not trying to achieve any particular outcome other than staying grounded and rooted in our own being. In the peace, the love, the happiness, the joy that exists at our core. when we don't need it from something out there, then we'll free up the world to be as it is, other people to be as they are. Because we're not trying to get it external to ourselves. When we already have it, then the freedom for every, everyone else comes because then we don't need them to be any particular way for us to have any more of it because we already have a sense of fulfillment. And again, I say this is a fairly simple but not easy. And I notice myself still today, I'll probably, again, I don't know how today will play out, but there's probably going to be some sense of reflecting uh, or some reflecting on this position or this job that I've been offered next week, even though it's not something that's like big and uh, definite, permanent. It's just asking me to work one weekend. But being willing to even be honest with myself about that, you know, is that really something that I want to do? Not forever and ever. Not, is this something I want to do forever and ever, but is this something that feels true for me to do now as it's being asked? And to be willing to sit even in the, I don't know right now, until the answer comes. Not trying to force an answer to be there too quickly. So I hope this was helpful. Yeah, I've taken a lot of uh, side turns and sat in some kind of muddled ponds kind of on the side of the river for a while, being stuck there and not sure how these concepts all come together because it seems to be this paradox that the mind can't understand, you know. It's effort, but it's effortless. It's groundedness and centeredness and self, and yet it's still doing. It's to you know we are love, but we might act in unloving ways, perceived as unloving ways. How does that make sense? It doesn't really. So I encourage you more than anything not to take these as concepts to believe in, but to sit with them and play with them and experiment in your own life. You know, how do I compromise myself with these shoulds and shouldn'ts? How do I step away from my own knowing? Even just even if our actions don't change, just being willing to, to take a look and be honest. You know, oh, I compromise myself here, or I compromise myself there. Or I had an agenda there, or I was trying to manipulate this person here to fulfill my sense of my neediness or my sense of insecurity. Always doing this from a place of loving kindness or warm heartedness towards ourselves. We're not adding more shame and we're not doing it with the this sense of trying as we talked about before this like trying to make ourselves different or trying to now get it right to come and bring that relaxed stance where we can just observe what's playing out observe not just 
you know, as complacent, but observe the whole totality, even the dysfunctional part of it, to really take that in and to feel the pain of it. To feel how it feels when we manipulate circumstances or bring an agenda when we have an interaction with someone. Then it's bringing in the totality of the experience and we can't it becomes harder and harder to become complacent when we can actually feel physiologically the pain of that movement. And it doesn't mean that that movement will suddenly just stop. That we will then always start moving from a place of alignment. No. It might be pretty messy for a while as we kind of figure it out and learn to discern within ourselves. But if we're diligent and continually bringing our attention back and being willing to see the wholeness of the experience, the more those ways of engaging that are dysfunctional will just start to fall away on their own. without that trying to make them go away. Again, another paradox, the more we're trying to make something go away, the more we're not in acceptance of it as it is, acceptance of ourself as we are. So I've spoken enough today, I think. Um, yeah, this is a really uh, moving topic for me because authenticity has been one of those guiding values that I've had for quite some time. Just continually practicing being able to trust that authentic expression, even when it means people might no longer be in my life or I might disappoint people. They might want something of me I can't do. I might potentially lose the job. It opens ourselves to the full vulnerability of our being. But I believe in a way that's totally worth it. To be free of all that suffering contained in the shoulds and shouldn'ts and living out of these beliefs that are fueling us to always seek what we're looking for inside of ourselves. Thank you. Be well. Till next time. Bye-bye.